You want the truth? We're going to give you the truth now. You're hearing it from my own mouth, and this is how it all unfolded. Honestly, what was going through my head is I wanted to go home and see my family. I wasn't ready to die. Hey guys, I'm Mick Mansell from Madison Mechanical. This is my first big accident story. I think first year we rocked up to Kudamundra would have been New Law Nationals. I had rocked up in my Red 33 JDR, known as MSM JDR. No one ever knew who Motorsaw Mechanical was. We were just a quiet workshop. Um, we rocked up. I didn't even know how to drive a JDR. Got on the two-step, dropped the clutch, rode through the gears, and I went 9.4 at 155 mile an hour. Come back around, I see this guy looking at me with a big smirk on his face and a camera in his hand yelling at me, oh, you just broke the manual record. Then he goes to me, he goes, is that car sequential? I said, no, nah, it's H-pattern. He goes, I don't believe you. I opened my door, put my clutch in. I showed him how it's got gears. He shook his head. He said, come down to Kudamundra next year. And we're there. Look, to be honest with you, I, I believe, I looked at, at the track, obviously you're fast, you're fast. You've got a record. But obviously if you're, you're fast there, you're the king. That's the way I look at it because at the end of the day, the street outside, my workshop's probably better than Kudamundra, but if you can make a car run a low eight second pass, a seven second pass at Kudamundra, you're the king. Like, and that's, that's where I've been chasing every year, manual, automatic, whatever it took. Like when every time we go, I always pushed. I always knew we're either gonna break it or we're gonna make it. That's the mentality we always had behind it. We did have the fastest manual record in Daniel's car for years. Like I think it was three years there. Then we did have the fastest sequential record in MSM JDR for like two or three years as well. Like that was the same time as MSM H9 back then. Then MSM H7 came out and then it was just the underdog. We just give it all we got. Two. Eight two two seven. <laughs> Dude, what did you just do? What did you just say to Andrew? I just told him it, we went slow. <laughs> <laughs> so I let him stress a bit down there. Okay. Yeah! Eight twenty two. Number one. <laughs> and I, I did get number one, and I did have number one for two or three years. And every year I went there, always my legs were shaking, waiting. I wouldn't leave on a Saturday afternoon just to make sure I left still number one. And if I did, I'd be smirking around and screaming, I am the champion on the way home. But yeah, I went back there to do it all again. Between Peter Wolf's car, between Sal's car, between, between all my customers' cars, every time I just get thrown the keys, I'll go for a ride. I have to have gone that airstrip at least 100, 150 times. From 2017 to 2000, it's been six years. So we've been down there a fair, fair amount of times. Started building MSM Jet for Robert. And the car was always meant to be street car, street car, McDonald's, street car. We even, funny enough, argued about a DVD player in the car. And I said, it's a drag car. Stop calling it a street car because it's got registration. Forward, back, forward, back, the car makes 2,100 horsepower. Most we've ever made with an RB. The year we took it with RH7, maybe I had six, seven, eight passes in it. It was wild. No matter which way I pedaled it, no matter which way I steered it, just didn't want to get tamed. No matter how much power I pulled out of it, it just didn't want to know about it. Long story short, put it in the garage, Kudamundra was coming. And I was dying to go back, because obviously I have to be number one. That's in my head, that's my mentality. I have to be number one. And I rang Andrew and he said, no, we said no more pro street cars. I said, what about if I put an exhaust on it, put ethanol in it? He said, if you return it back to a true street, I'll let it come. If not, no go. I promised you all last year. I tried to twist his hand a little bit. Didn't get a plan. So guess what? We started welding, full exhaust, put it back on the dyno, E98, and let's go. We rocked up with 1500 horsepower. And yeah, the history was made from there on. So we rocked up Friday morning. I was all excited, yelling at everyone, get the tires off, let's put new tires on. Took a spare automatic gearbox with me, I took a spare head with me, I said I'm going for it. Whichever way it takes, I'm going for it. Let's go out, first pass off the truck, ready to go, with nice 70s. Eight, eight, I 
thought it was pretty wild because car went like it was on railway lines, bit to the left, straight on the rough, like I drive every other GDR in that level between MSM GDR and MSM H7 and the black pro car that we own. Drive out the back door, 870, on low boost. Turn around, come back to the pits, pack the chutes, drain the oils. We're confident, like we just went 870 on low boost, like to tame, like ready to go. Pull the car back out, do my warm up burnout, get to the start line. Car then goes 84 and misfired on cylinder three. A bit over half track and I held into it. Held into it, made it out the back door at 840. Come back, check the log. I found cylinder three went in full rich, wasn't burning the fuel. Told the boys to put the plug out of the car and it was just the lead had a pinhole in it. Still got it in my truck, had just a little pinhole in it. Perfect, put a new lead in it, fired her up. All six cylinders, comp tested, it was perfect. Said so beautiful. I did put it on 60 pound in the deep end. Um, the run before was 55 and misfired. I probably should have left it and tried again without the misfire and I probably would have went at 820. But my mentality was, we went 84 with a misfire, another 10 pound of boost we can make it, like we can make this happen. Like either we're gonna get eight zeros, eight ones, seven nine, like we're close enough. Everything's worked. Let's just, we'll give it a go. I had that smirk, I got out of the car, I looked at all the boys with a smirk on my face. So this run, it was, it, was, it was a scary moment because I tapped the back of the parachutes and I said to my boys, and they're all watching me, they're all two years. I tapped the back of the parachute and I said, don't kill me this run. I've never said it, never once have I said it to any car because I never get scared of a car. Like whenever I jump in, I have a mentality, I drive you, you don't drive me. So I just, I tapped the chutes, I said, don't kill me. I yelled out, I go, give me my arm restraints. I clip myself up, don't know why, I have no idea. I tightened up my Simpson harness, tightened her up in my seat, ready to go on a roller coaster ride. I don't know if I was scared because I turned that up. I don't know if it was a sign. Get to the burnout pad, trans brake on, go to do a burnout, wouldn't come up, come up on boost. There's only CO2, no CO2. Drive back to the truck, yell at Ray a bit, cause he didn't fill it up. He said, I did fill it up. Shows me it's full, so put it back in. My brother had closed it, Ray had opened it. Get back out, do my warm up burnout. First part of the track, it was actually more tame because I, I got it to leave nice and sensible. Nothing out of the ordinary, like it done it before. It goes towards the left, comes back. I've gone towards the left, I've pedaled it like I did. I can compare all four logs, they were identical. I could see the finish line, I'm looking at the finish line. It's starting to pull me towards the grass. I'm looking, I said, nah, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it, I'll worry about it when I'll strain her up when we get past it. Towards the grass, towards the grass, I've pulled my wheel about from 12 o'clock maybe to about 11 o'clock. It's just coming, still going. I can see the finish line, it's coming. It's coming, I look at my Motec dash, I see 60 pound. I get that smirk on my face, oh, here we go. Like, we're moving. I know in my head, it's moving. Got towards the grass, just touched it. Like I am talking, just touched it. You'll see in the video. Just touched the grass, I've corrected my steering wheel from 12 o'clock to one o'clock. It's come out sideways, I thought I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. And bang, it was over. Front, front right wheel blew the tire off the rim and we started. My heart's actually racing, eh? like, you know, I'm talking about it now, my heart's racing. It rolled the tire off the rim. The, even if I just tapped the grass a little bit sideways, I would have been okay. It had rolled the tire off the rim. And at that moment, I knew it was over. Like I had predicted in my head, I said, I'm dead. It started rolling, I grabbed the steering wheel and I'm looking straight ahead of me. 
and I'm watching bonnets fly, I'm watching windscreens fly, I'm still awake, it's rolling, it's banging, and I'm screaming in this car, stop, stop, stop. It wouldn't listen this time, I don't know why it wouldn't listen. We finally stopped. I didn't know at this point, am I alive, am I dead? I was just black in the eyes, I couldn't see in front of me. Sitting there, sitting there, my heart was racing. I'm still alive. I found the buckle. I didn't know if I was upside down, didn't know if I was ready to go. I undid the buckle, I landed from the roof to the floor. Then I started touching around to see where I am. I found the window, I got a quick gust of cold air on my hand. I said, man, that's outside. I still couldn't see. So I started crawling out the window. As I crawled out the window, undid my helmet and just laid down on the grass for a rest till everyone got there. Honestly, what was going through my head is I wanted to go home and see my family. I wasn't ready to die. So look, at the beginning, when I got out of the car, when I got to the hospital, I was laying there, medications, MRI scans, everything. I come out of the MRI scan, the doctor looked at me and I kept on saying to him, my neck doesn't hurt, I'm fine, I'm fine. Doctor kept on saying to him, mate, I go, please get this neck brace off. He said, mate, we can't get it off till we do the MRI. He does the MRI, he wasn't convinced. Put me through another one, he still wasn't convinced. He come back, he looks at me, unclips it off my neck, he goes, mate, you're a miracle. He goes to me, he goes, I've read the report. He goes, you rolled that car 11 times. He asked me how fast, I said 210 kilometers. At this stage, I hadn't checked the log. I didn't know how fast I was going. I hadn't spoken to anyone yet to know what had really happened. After he took my brace off, he said, mate, you can sit up, we'll give you some medication. Got my medication, Andrew rang me. Hey mate, how are you traveling? I said, yeah man, I'm fine, believe it or not. No broken bones. Nothing. I got a bit of bruising. It looks like I had a fight with Mike Tyson, but I'm fine. Mate, I'm going to go home. I'm going to send my wife and kids. From that moment, I started getting the stories. The real problem is, it's all stories. Like, it's all what really happened. I had to find out myself because I, I don't remember what happened. I do, I do remember the accident. I do remember laying on the grass, telling the paramedics, don't cut my Adidas t shirt because I really love my t shirt. He cut all off my clothes and I said to Andrew, I said, man, I'm cold. He went and got me a sheet, covered me up, playing my cousin's hair, telling him I know who he is even though I couldn't see him. I asked Mark, the fire brigade, I was touching the car with my leg. I go, hey, Mark, how's the car? He said, yeah, mate, it'll buff out. I said, oh, mad, beautiful. I was excited, we can buff the car out. It can't be that bad then. Little did I know, <laughs> there was no buffing. So from the time the phone call was made till the ambulance got to me, it was 11 minutes exactly. I think, to be honest with you, I think that's pretty cool because I've heard people 50, 60, 40 minutes. I wasn't there for long. For 11 minutes, I think, was an instant response. How we all lined up, I could never explain it to you. Look, I, I, rem I do remember hearing Mark's voice very fast with my brother screaming out my name fast because by the time the car stopped rolling, I unbuckled and got out of that car. Everyone was there. Oh, look, every time I say Mark, I say hello. He's got a smile on his face, says welcome back. We, we, we had a relationship, but Mark, I messaged him. I said, mate, I eat a dinner, I eat a drink when you come down, because that guy did save my life. Like, I can't, I can't thank Mark enough, because Mark was there looking after me, talking to me, still making me laugh, even though I couldn't see him. The guy's a champion. Like, my relationship with them, mate, oh, oh my life. He laid me down, he said, stay down, don't move. He done everything he had to do till the ambulance got there. I can't thank him enough. I've been doing my research into that. There is a medical truck that sits on site and they look after you till the ambulance gets here. And it was the same response I got at Kudamandra. But I actually got a better response at Kudamandra than I probably would have anywhere else. Look, that helmet was Robert's helmet. He bought it for himself. And Robert always goes that extra level to buy the best stuff. And I always yell at him for it. I say, you don't need it. Didn't fit him. And I said, oh, this is my time to upgrade my helmet. So I took his helmet. That helmet did save my life. That was the best helmet. It was an impact, full funny car helmet. It was a helmet. The run before, how it all unfolded, why I strapped myself up this hard, why I put my arm restraints on, why I tightened my helmet. I, I, I could, I'd be lying if I'd say to you, I knew it was going to happen. Or I'd, I, I, the way it all unfolded, it's scary. It's been a traumatic experience. The first couple of nights were very hard for me to sleep about it, thinking about it, dreaming about it. Man, like I always think, imagine I didn't. Like, had a normal helmet with, with it loose. Did I not have the arm restraints? Did I have my harness loose? Now when you think about it, and I've seen the car, 
and I've seen the video and I've seen how the windscreen went and I've seen how far the turbo, turbo went off the car. It, it scares me and I've, I've, I've had dreams about it that I ejected out of the car and I tumbled and I died at the scene and my, it's, it's a traumatic experience. Look, I've always been the guy for safety every time I go to Eastern Creek. I don't, I've never been the guy to be like, oh, just don't worry about it, let's go. I've always put my gear on, I've always, I'm all for safety, I always have been. I don't know how to lift off the pedal. It is a very, very, very bad habit. Will it change? I'll find that in a week or two, because I will be getting back behind the wheel to race MSM H7. Will I be educating a lot of people? Yes, this is why I'm here to do the video. Roll cages, street racing, mate, I honestly, I, I, thank, I, I thank the Lord every day. There was no power poles around. There was nothing to, like, the way it all unfolded, and I hope the video does change a lot of people's perspective on a roll cage. I can't thank Tully from Monksa Fabrication for that roll cage. That roll cage kept that car together from every roll from 270 kilometers. It rolled 11 times. That cabin was intact. Would I tell anyone to put a roll cage in their car? 150%. Money, street car, I don't want to ruin my car. Mate, would you rather die or would you rather be here to live in a does? What can you pay to be alive? How much money? It's a piece of meal, you can't. There's a lot of ifs and buts. Should I have let off when it went to the half track sideways? Like when it went a bit to the side, if I let off all those three runs, I wouldn't have even been at the A40s. Like that's, if you want to talk technically, that's, that's the way I look at it. If it, had I let off when it was going towards the grass, who knows? Who, who know, what would have happened? Like who knows if the next run I would have said, oh, put a bit more in it. Well, let's, let's do the, look, there's, there's a lot of ifs and buts. But at the end of the day, I didn't let off. It's done. It's racing, right? It's racing. Like every time I go to the track, you run a, I'll go 750s and I think, oh man, I should pull more in it. Then I, then I pass or it doesn't go anywhere and I'm like, I think I put too much in it. You can't, you can't always predict what's gonna happen. I, look, at the end of the day, it's either gonna work or it won't work. And at Kudamundra, that's the way it goes. Like, what if, had, it, had I, had I not, had I this, it's too late now, man. You can't, you can't sit there and wish that we didn't do A, B, C, D. Can I blame the tires? Can I blame the rim? Can I blame the driver? Can I blame the event organizer? Can I blame the cameraman? You can't blame anyone. At the end of the day, this is the risk we take every single time. You let go of that button, this is racing, this is what we love doing. I hadn't seen the car till, I think it was Friday night, maybe about 11 o'clock at night, when I got six photos of it, my heart stopped. When I actually seen it, because Mark had lied to me and told me that it can buff out. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, when I actually seen what the car looked like, I was actually like, wow, like, I don't have a broken bone. I don't have anything. Oh yeah, I've got a bruised rib, bruised lung, bruising, swelling all over my body. But mate, I can do with that. Had I been paralyzed, had I been dead, had I never been able to walk again, had I been brain dead because my brain was full of blood, mate, the result for what it was, I can't, I, 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 yeah, it's, it has me baffled every day. The police officers, they wanted to see me on video call. The fire brigade, we called Mark, I called Andrew, we seen Susie. My mates, wow, I, I was a bit baffled. All grown up men, my best mate, he was in tears, begging me to get up. We still gotta go partying for his bucks party. Uh, mate, I couldn't, uh, the love, the people, it had me baffled. After an event like this, the last thing you want is negativity. Like I just lost a $400,000 car. I was gutted. I was, mate, the car belongs to my customer slash friend. He's, he's actually a good friend. He belongs to Robert. I rang him up when I was in the hospital bed that night. I said, hey, Rob. I said, man, scan's all good. All the boys are in front of the hotel. I hear everyone screaming, yeah, woo. I heard a couple of bottles getting banged around. I said, oh, great. These guys are still partying without me. And I said to Robert, hey, you a seven second car. He said to me, shut up. You don't owe me nothing as long as you're all right. I said, I'll be all good. I hear a car. When I get home, we're going to work it out. Look, at the end of the day, the positive stuff kept me going. The negative stuff is very toxic. And when I say negative stuff, it was all the stories floating around. At the end of the day, it's all, it, it, it all just goes around as stories and, oh, he did this and she did that. Uh, to be honest with you, I was in the back shed waiting for it. 
and I knew Ryan was towing it back. And my wife sends me a message and I check my phone and she goes to me, I do not want to come outside, that is scary. And I'm thinking, well, what's she talking about? And I realised, oh, the car's here. As I see the tow truck backing in, I was scared because this is the first time I've seen it off, been off its roof. I only seen photos of it on its roof. I didn't see, got in the shed, mate, I was shaking. My anxiety levels, my stress. I walked inside, I closed the shed door and I said, I'll look at you tomorrow, I'll worry about it tomorrow. I walked back in the next day thinking, look, I'll just hang on to it, I'll hang on to it. Every day I looked at it, just killed me, like mentally killed me up. I looked at it, mate, and just the only part that wasn't impacted was my cabin. Saturday came from Monday. I rang, I rang Ray, I rang with Steve, I rang all the boys from the shop. I said, listen, everyone get to my house, we're stripping the car. They gave me, all right, everyone gets here at 8 a.m. I'm parallel, I'm, I'm very sore, so I can't do nothing. I'll just be the guy that stands there and yells at everyone, same as normal. Um, so I sat down, I'm watching the car get stripped, yelling at him, don't cut anything. To be dead honest with you, engine intact, gearbox intact, rear axles diff intact, world rims, two rims are saveable, two rims are buckled, get them fixed, no big issues. Interior, from dashboard to back seat, parcel shelf was broken, I saved everything, door trims, quarter cards, parcel uh, roof linings, everything, fuel tech, Motec PDMs, shifter, everything. And I always said to the boys, I said, man, I was wearing arm restraints. And they laughed at me like, yeah, yeah all right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I remember my mate Musti was in the car and he goes, oh, look, look what I found that it was in his hand. And I do remember, I did put them on, but I just didn't know where they were. But out of the whole car, I saved everything. Even the nitrous bottle that was hissing, he just stripped the braided line, saved both carbon bottles, saved everything. Everything was savable. The only thing I really lost at the end of it was a shell, was a couple of little things, but hey, it's all replaceable. Life can't be replaced. I can't live knowing I owe someone something. I said, do you know what? I said, I, I, had, I had to give up the love of my life. As much as I love her, as much as me and her have had a long relationship, we've done everything together. Where it's time to share her. So now I've officially given Robert MSM JDR. It is now MSM Jet. It will not be called MSM JDR. I've handed her over, that's his car now. I will be rebuilding the car for free for him. I'll be doing whatever I can do to help him to bring back what we had. And we're gonna continue the journey. I, I was actually shocked. I picked up the phone, I rang Peter Hypertune because it was more, he was ringing me. Mate, are you all right? Mate, you all right? Checking up on me as well, ringing me. I said, Pete, I said, I need your help. He said, what do you need? I said, I broke, manifold's damaged, this and that. He said, Mick, he goes, come to my shop, take whatever you want. And he wasn't lying. I walked into Hypertune, I picked up a brand new billet plenum, brand new billet rocker covers, titanium bits, picked up clamps, whatever I wanted, just like it was mine. Big mess, fabrication, mate, you baffled me. I rang ya, you were there when I had the accident. You were shocked that I actually called ya to tell you we're building another car. And I said, when can you fab it? And you go to me, you go, oh, two cars have pulled out. I said, so can I send it now? And you're like, yeah, when do you need it done by? I said, two days. And you go to me, two days? I said, no, no, two days, I need to send it to Tully's to get the cage done, to get the twin shoots pulled back on it. Tully Monster Fabrication, wow, another guy. Dropped everything, mate, we'll help you wherever we can help you. We'll get you back to where you started. I can't thank you guys enough. Look, he's going to be doing all the cars from the shop. I think, I think a lot of the customers realise now because I used to always get, I said, oh man, put a cage in the car. Nah, man, I don't want to ruin it. Oh, I just want to drive the car. I want to take my mates in the car. I don't want to get defect. Now, look, there's four cars waiting to go to Tully's. We're, they're all ready to go. At the end of the day, like I said, mate, it's safety. I know, I know it's not the prettiest thing. I know you butt your head every time you get in and out of it. I know, but... I used to always curse every time I get in and out of it, and I used to swear at it. Do I swear at it now? I thank, I thank God for I'll kiss that piece of bar again, because that's what did save me. It's IDS in, the, in America. Mate, I sent you a photo of the shock that was damaged. You said to me, Mick, I got you covered, don't stress. Mate, I couldn't thank you enough, David. I appreciate it. Mate, we'll always be there to support you. Jonathan Gauchi from Profab and Joe. Mate, every day messages to check up on me, make sure I'm all good. Convincing me that we need to go to Kenda and continue on racing. Fuel Tech, Nathaniel, mate, you're amazing. Thank you for everything you've done. Continue supporting me, helping me, whatever I need. Uh, Kobo, thanks, Ace, mate, even though I'm gonna chop you still. I know that you always look after us. I rang you yesterday for a wastegate, bang, you dropped it off straight away. 
but I'm still going to give you the chop chop. Don't stress, JDR for life. Alex from Hospital Industries, the turbo that went 60 to 80 meters up in the air. My dad Garrett Turbo as a soldier. Mara gave it to you to check up on it. You came with that amazing phone call telling me it's, it's in perfect condition. Mate, thank you for your honesty. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everything you do for us. I just want to say thank you to the boys at Nido for jumping on board to give us a hand to get the car back together. Look what this belt does on me for the green. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this forever. I'm not going to let it go. I did go there for this belt, to be honest with you. When I seen this belt, I remember I sent it in the group chat and I said to the boys, I'm going for that one. So obviously Andrew's willing to jump on board and give us a hand and we want to we wanna show everyone what we're going to do with the red one. We've already started with the red one. We've already, the boys, I, my, my, the boys at my shop have been incredible. I haven't been there. I've been off for two weeks. I'm going on to my third, still a bit sore. But mate, the red one's already stripped, already dummied up. It's already getting fabricated. It's already going to get the cage done. The boys are moving faster than I can move, to be honest with you. We will be doing a full motive video on the car getting built to show everyone what we will be returning. We will be returning bigger and better. I promise you guys that. I just want to say thank you to all the fireys from Kudamundra. I wanted to say thank you to Andrew Hawkins and Susie for always checking up on me, ringing me 50 times a day to make sure I was all good. The police, the ambulance, I just wanted to thank, thank all my crew. My crew packed up the truck, didn't even have me stressing, bringing me close to the, to the hospital, looking after me, making sure I wasn't doing anything I didn't have to do. And obviously my wife for being all right with everything. We've semi-convinced that we're going back to Kutamundra in September. So we're going back and we'll continue on the journey.